This is Ayana Young, and I welcome you to Unlearn and Rewild, where we explore radical ideas relating to earth renewal. Scientists worldwide are warning of the looming extinction of thousands of species, from tigers and polar bears to rare flowers, birds, and insects. If the destruction continues, half of all species of plants and animals could disappear by the end of the century and with them Earth's life support ecosystems that provide our food, water, medicine, and natural defenses against climate change. Our guest today, Carolyn Frazier, has written the first definitive account of a visionary campaign to confront this crisis, entitled Rewilding the World, Dispatches from the Conservation Revolution. Breathtaking in scope and ambition, Rewilding aims to save species by restoring habitats, reviving migration corridors, and brokering peace between people and predators. Traveling with wildlife biologists and conservationists, Caroline reports on the vast projects that are turning Europe's former Iron Curtain into a green belt, creating trans-frontier peace parks to renew elephant routes throughout Africa, and linking protected areas from the Yukon to Mexico and beyond. Carolyn Fraser was born in Seattle and holds a Ph.D. from Harvard University in English and American Literature. Formerly on the editorial staff of The New Yorker, she has written for The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, Outside Magazine, Allure, and The Los Angeles Times Book Review, among other publications. Her essays and reviews have also appeared frequently in The New York Review of Books and Yale Environment 360. She has received a Penn Award for Best Young Writer and numerous prizes for her poetry. Married to Hal Aspen, she lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Thank you for joining us, Caroline. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Since this program reaches a wide array of listeners, in addition to ecologists and environmental scientists, I'd love to take this hour to get a nice overview of the world of rewilding its visions, its successes and failures, you know, where the energy is now and where you see things going. I'd like to create a foundation for future programs to elaborate on, but of course you're invited to go as deep as you are inclined. <laughs> so rewilding has two major uses. First, restoring degraded lands to a more ecologically functional and diverse state. And second, you know, it means freeing your mind, that is, reversing domestication on a psychological level to rejoin the natural world. We cover both on this program, but today we're focusing on physical rewilding. So can you elaborate on this definition and give us a little introduction to this massive topic? Sure. Um, the the word rewilding uh, really entered the lexicon um, thanks to activists uh, and scientists. The, the guy who is credited with um, actually coining the word is Dave Foreman, who you probably uh, have heard of, a very um, famous and, and sometimes polarizing uh, figure who has had a sort of very uh, active political career <laughs> earlier on in, in protesting against dams and, uh, and so forth, but lately has turned to, to what he calls rewilding. And he teamed up with a, a very um, renowned conservation biologist named Michael Soule, and together they kind of created this uh, concept of rewilding as a conservation method. And it really relies on, on a few uh, basic core tenants, which are called the three C's, cores, corridors, and carnivores. Uh, that was sort of the original concept. Um, and what that means is to try to focus on preserving 
in maintaining core conservation areas. Uh, these are, you know, they can be anything from the kinds of national parks that we have here in the U.S., uh, the kinds of national parks you see around the world in places like South Africa, or places that are, are still largely untouched, like the Amazon in South America. And the concept is to try to identify those, those major core areas that we still have, that are still intact, and try to do everything that we can to preserve those. Um, and then it's also, you know, become quite clear that we need ways to connect those cores to each other um, in order to preserve things like major migratory paths. Um, and that's where the corridors come in. Corridors is a concept that I think people uh, initially maybe have a hard time relating to, but it's very similar to, you know, any kind of corridors that people use. I mean, we use highways and so forth as transportation mechanisms to get around, and so do animals. And animals, uh, endangered species, uh, migratory species, they need ways to be able to reach core areas. And uh, I write a lot about, for instance, jaguars in South America and their use of potential corridors. And so another thing about rewilding is trying to identify those corridors that either still exist or that we can recreate between core protected areas so that we make sure to maintain not just biological diversity in the the most simple sense, but also genetic diversity. Um, if If one jaguar can move from uh, from one park to another and bring his genetic material uh, to a new population, that's really important, particularly at a time when we're losing um, so many populations. Uh, so that's corridors. And then finally, carnivores, <laughs> again with the jaguars. But, you know, the the carnivores were were recognized early on as a kind of a major linchpin for protecting diversity, because if you protect the the big animals at the top of the food chain, uh, which are in many cases uh, carnivores, then you have a kind of knock-on effect all the way down that food chain. So that was the initial concept of rewilding, and um, I don't have a problem with with people talking about various other interpretations of it, uh, as you you mentioned in your introduction, you know, people have started talking about, you know, rewilding, you know, the human spirit and, and all of that. And that's that's fine. But I think we, we need to recognize that the word does have a specific um, scientific meaning and and all the rest of it flows from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've traveled the seven continents in an epic mission to experience the rewilding projects, you know, not just to report the cold facts, but to give a sense of the whole picture surrounding these efforts, the political and the social context. Can you tell us about your journeys? How did you come into this passion? And where has the journey taken you intellectually? Um, just to take the first part of that, I first heard about the whole concept of rewilding at the New York Central Park Zoo. I went to a lecture there uh, in the 1990s, um, and the concept was just so far out. <laughs> I mean, it just seemed like almost like something from science fiction. And this was based on, again, on Michael Soule's um, essays, things that he had written about how to achieve uh, rewilding on a very massive scale. And he was talking about some very fascinating concepts that really were drawn from science fiction where he suggested that perhaps all of humanity, we could confine ourselves to a very small footprint. <laughs> and he was suggesting, I think, uh, basically something the size of around Texas and leave everything else <laughs> in North America to wilderness. And, and I mean, this kind of thing has, has gotten him in a certain amount of trouble over the years <laughs> because I don't think he's... Um, completely serious about it, but I think he likes to talk in these 
visionary terms to sort of give people an idea of what's possible. And that was what really hooked me, I think, was not that I really imagined that that's ever going to happen, but the kind of social engineering that is going to be necessary in order to accomplish a lot of what has been envisioned by people like Dave Foreman and Michael Soule is is very, very challenging. And uh, even even conservationists who are working in very traditional organizations like, you know, the World Wildlife Fund or for organizations associated with the UN, um, they're not thinking about those kinds of sci-fi type concepts, but they have encountered all the the challenges that come with that territory. They have I think it's been really recognized after decades of trial and error that in order to practice conservation on a large scale, which is what all the scientists say needs to happen in order to actually save as many species as we can, uh, it's going to entail really working directly on the ground with communities who live alongside and in these ecosystems and that has proven to be a very challenging thing indeed because, for one thing, scientists are not really given to, you know, that's not their field. So I think scientists and conservationists and biologists and all the people on, on who are trained in those methods have needed to really kind of either team up with people who do know how to do those things or they've needed to really kind of reinvent themselves in a way and discover how they can work with people in a way that yields the best possible outcome for everybody. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the murkier areas of the rewilding movement, which is taking into account the needs of you know, in many cases, the poor and the indigenous people in the broad conservation goals. You know, mm -hmm. many of these people may live on land not officially recognized by the governments, but it may be ancestral land. There has rightfully been resistance to large outside organizations, mostly headed by, you know, white people with a lot of funds who come in and tell them that they can't hunt in certain areas or they can't gather firewood or what have you. So yeah. how have conservation groups tried to balance human needs and conservation needs without repeating the patterns of colonialism? And and do you think it's been working? Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, um, there are some pretty spectacular success stories and, and equally spectacular failures uh, across the board. And, and one of the examples that I... Uh, highlight and, and often talk about as a success story is the project known as Lewa, which is in north central Kenya, which has been really successful in in inviting basically all the local communities in the region to join them in developing their community conservation projects and trying to reopen the area to wildlife, make it safe for big animals like elephants and rhinos, while at the same time allowing for a lot of basic work in the communities to develop, you know, health clinics and contribute to education and endow schools and also contribute to greater success with livestock in the area. And that, I think, has worked because in part, I think that the people who were behind Lewa, which was a family that had been involved in the area for many years, but what, they were a white family, Ian Craig and, and the Craig family, really had close ties to many of the Maasai people and villages. And you know, I've seen Ian Craig in action. I've I've watched, you know, their meetings take place uh, with the Maasai. And I just, I think that they've found, in part because of those really close and respectful relationships, they've found a really good balance between conservation and, and community. 
in that particular project. But other projects more seem like, you know, people are coming in from outside and inflicting conservation on people. And that can always be a problem. And so I think I think in a lot of ways that the projects that do succeed succeed because they really grow out of naturally out of the relationships that have been nurtured there for years. And I think that that really has to happen. And I don't think it can be uh, quid pro quo kind of thing. I don't think it can just be people coming in from outside and paying people off or establishing a school here or a health clinic there. I think conservationists really have to be in the community and have a stake in it and ideally live there and spend their lives there. <laughs> Conservation projects around the world have had trouble when they try to operate independent of the local communities. One example is the Limpopo Park in Mozambique and South Africa, where elephants, jaguars, and hyenas were released, and luxury tourist infrastructure was built to capitalize on it. But unfortunately, not a lot of attention was paid to the needs of the local residents. The ecological objectives weren't really communicated. And I understand the results were a bit discouraging. Many of the animals ended up being killed. On the other hand, there is the case of the Lebombo Park, which was very successful. So what was done differently in Limbombo? Yeah, this is, the, I mean, this continues to be just a very fraught area. And, and I think you have to step back and look at the history of, of everything that, that happened with these, you know, projects between South Africa and Mozambique and, you know, now Zimbabwe is, is a part of um, some of these projects as well and in and, and many cr- countries across the board in Southern Africa. And the politics of these um, projects are rooted in apartheid history and incredible conflict between South Africa and Mozambique, which that's now over. But there are still a lot of political elements that are influencing and making all of this difficult. And one of the things that I think you see as a result in these projects in Southern Africa is that things tend to happen very, very slowly. It's been pretty hard to make things work across borders in those places. And particularly now that they're having really terrible issues with poaching, particularly of rhinos, but also elephant. So they've had to to work very slowly and and carefully in a lot of uh, these these instances. And the and the you know the thing that I was talking about with the the great Limpopo was you know that that was kind of a almost a where they just sort of brought in a lot of. Uh, elephants and, and just kind of opened the fences in a kind of quick way because there was so much press attention and you know they wanted to kind of make a splash they wanted to um, to let people around the world know that this was happening but it had a kind of an unfortunate effect of of uh, taking a lot of people in the area by surprise and 
they had a lot of issues as a result of that. And so I think all of those big Peace Park funded projects have had, you know, they've had to be very careful about how they proceed based on that kind of initial misstep. And there have been some small advances and, you know, it's, it's sort of two steps forward and one step back a lot of the time. But I think that the smaller and more manageable these projects are and the more there are people on the ground who are able to stay in a region. One of the challenges, I think, for conservation groups in dealing with these kinds of issues is that a lot of um, conservation is funded for, you know, a certain number of years, like, you know, they'll get a five-year grant or something like that. And then, you know, if the grant is not renewed or they don't have continued funding, then they have to pull out or they have to pull their people out after two or three years. And continuity, I think, is a huge factor um, mm-hmm. in maintaining the success of these projects to have people who stay with them for decades if necessary. So that's a very tricky thing to make work. What are the organizations and networks that are behind these rewilding projects? You know, this was actually kind of a surprise to me when I started reporting for the book because I hadn't realized that basically it's now a number of non-governmental organizations, as they call them, NGOs. And these are widely known around the world, World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International. There are a number of UN agencies that are doing work in this And I think that is part of the problem, not that these organizations aren't good and not that they're not well-meaning, but because of the the very, you know, kind of massive international infrastructure, if you will, (laughs) of these groups, that they tend to have less contact with uh, the people on the ground than they perhaps should And they also, I talked a little bit about this in Costa Rica, they can just all of a sudden kind of pull out. And that tends to really leave a bad taste in the mouth of people who live in these places. It's a very tricky dynamic. And some of them do a good job of trying to find the local people who are really doing great stuff. The the Australian groups that I talk about have really benefited from that because They've been identified, and and also uh, groups in Nepal have been very well supported by uh, World Wildlife Fund, which has really, I think, done a good job in Nepal of identifying where the people are really having a positive impact on discouraging poaching and so forth and supporting that. But it doesn't always work out that way. So that's an area, I think, where conservation could really improve. And, you know, the UN is another area which is really, really (laughs) discouraging sometimes to see how little influence and how little money is being spent. And that's really the only worldwide organization that is looking at what's happening with conservation, but they don't have any teeth. They don't have any real impact because their treaties aren't really binding and they can't really exercise much influence over countries such as Japan, for instance, with their quote-unquote scientific whaling or Mm -hmm. countries that may be violating laws regarding tuna fishing and so forth. And so they're really important on the one hand, but it's very distressing that they don't have really very much uh, power or influence where it counts. Besides these large organizations like World Wildlife Fund, where do the grassroots movements fit in? Those are really interesting. And, you know, when I mentioned Australia, I was really talking about um, one of the groups there that is really notable in terms of what they've been able to achieve on the ground, and they've gotten support from bigger organizations, but they really came about as a result of local conservationists and people coming together and saying, what you know, what can we do about what's happening here and the damage that's been done to the land? The name of this group is Gondwana Link, and 
they've been really kind of amazing in in terms of of the challenges that they face because the land uh, in southwestern Australia, this is south of Perth, is uh, land that's been heavily damaged by sort of unwise agricultural uh, stripping of the land, which was done in the in the 1950s as part of a kind of massive effort to both employ war veterans that were coming home and and also just to kind of turn the whole of Western Australia into a vast wheat farm. <laughs> didn't really work out the way they had hoped because the the land there is so um, incredibly fragile and uh, had really, you know, there were these really fascinating kind of evolutionary relationships between the kinds of plants that had evolved there that that really utilized the very scarce water sources in in ways that protected um, the the soil and and created a kind of um, unique. Uh, microclimate in in certain areas, and and so when the farmers came in and and stripped all of that off, they actually changed the climate in very measurable ways, um, which is a, a kind of a fascinating thing to think about when you think about our own history of the Dust Bowl, because they basically made themselves a Dust Bowl in record time. That's <laughs> what they did, and. Um, we certainly did that as well. It took a little bit longer, but the Dust Bowl was a man-made event. And it's been really fascinating to watch what they've done in Australia because basically just local people and farmers who had seen the damage that was being done to the land got together and said, you know, look, we have to not only stop what we're doing, we have to go back. You know, we have to, to use... Um, buy up as much land as we can and recreate the original um, plant communities, plant and animal communities that were here before. And they've had some amazing results from doing that. They've worked really closely with um, Aboriginal people there, which I think is a, a really sterling example of communities coming together and kind of reaching out to each other because there hasn't historically been a lot of goodwill um, between the Aboriginal peoples there and farmers and the white community. And they've really, I think, modeled the best possible kind of rewilding by involving everybody and making it work for everybody. So that's a kind of shiny example, I think, of, of what everybody should be working for. Of course, it's different in every place around the world, but surely, you know, we can kind of look at examples like that and say that's that's what we need more of. Over 20 years ago, conservationist Harvey Locke wrote a famous essay which became the framework for the largest conservation effort in North America, Yellowstone to Yukon, or Y to Y. The strategy is to patch together a continuous corridor linking large blocks of public land in Western Canada and the U.S., buying up critical private land and securing protection in existing parks, and reforming destructive industrial activities. It's inspired a parallel project back east 
A to A or Algonquin to Adirondacks, and B to B, Baja to the Bering Strait, a marine conservation initiative. So would you mind elaborating on some of the details of Y2Y, what has been done and what needs to be done going forward? Y2Y is incredibly inspirational, I think, and they've managed to kind of raise a lot of awareness about what we stand to lose if we keep developing too much of this land. But again, this is a really interesting example to compare to what I was just talking about in Australia because the Y2Y project is so huge, which isn't to say that they don't have local people on the ground in various parts of that corridor, because they do. But it has been, I think, difficult for them to rally support in a lot of communities simply because of the, the real political polarization that we have now in this country. And so while they've had you know, various successes in in some parts. They've had some notable setbacks in others in terms of trying to convince people that this is in their best interest. And, you know, here I live in New Mexico, and here it's a real issue as well, and we're actually kind of at the very southern tip in some ways of, of Y2Y. And if you look at the whole Rocky Mountain chain, because there are various, you know, people who are kind of looking not only at Yellowstone to, to Yukon, but, but following that south throughout the Rockies all the way to Mexico. And it's a really, really tough environment in the United States because people have been pitted against each other. You know, communities have been pitted against each other by the political situation that we're facing. You know, I've been to so many meetings about, for example, the Mexican wolves here, and I know that this goes on uh, in the Yellowstone region as well, about wolves, that farmers and ranchers feel very threatened. They feel that their livelihoods are threatened and that conservationists don't understand that. And So it becomes a, you know, liberal versus conservative thing. It becomes a Republicans versus Democrats thing. And there's no way out of that except by dropping those particular positions, so far as I can see. And getting people to do that is close to impossible at this time. So having been to so many different places around the world. I can tell you that the United States is actually one of one of the worst climates in which to try to practice conservation because there isn't a respect for science and there isn't a recognition that these projects are vitally important to the health of communities. And it's become almost impossible for people to see that that our economy is directly tied to ecosystem services. This is a really, really hard concept for people to grasp. In your article, For Wolves on the Brink, A Hobbled Recovery Plan, you've called the Mexican wolf, quote, an irreplaceable fixture of the modern-day restorationist fondest dream, that a Noah's Ark of wolf, jaguar, and the Bolson tortoise may one day revive ecosystems in the Southwest, degraded by centuries of overgrazing and development, unquote. So could you explain how these animals are able to accomplish this? What are the mechanisms at play? Before we came along and upset the apple cart, so to speak, the ecosystems were functioning in a way that people can understand by thinking about the food chain, although it it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, at the top, you do have these these top predators like wolves and and, uh, lions and and, uh, tigers and and so forth. And, And those top predators heavily, heavily influence the prey base in ways that directly affect all kinds of other things, including 
plants and things that you might not really recognize that they're tied to, like fish. And the way that this has been understood is that in Yellowstone, where the wolf was absent for about 70, 75 years, they started to see, when the wolf came back, major changes taking place in the plant communities because the wolves were uh, impacting elk and deer and where those those elk and deer, their prey, were hanging out. You know, deer, when they had the run of the place, were just going to the easiest possible grazing sources, including river and stream banks and eating the tender vegetation there. And so they were actually changing uh, all kinds of things about those stream systems. Um, and because they were eating and grazing heavily on that vegetation, they were opening up the streams and making the water hotter because there wasn't as much overhanging leaf cover. Um, so when the wolves came back, they, they really started uh, improving all of those things because the deer were afraid to hang out by the rivers anymore because that's an excellent place to get caught and eaten by a wolf. So they really had to uh, start behaving more like prey animals. They had to really be worried about um, what was going to happen to them. They started leaving the the stream sides alone, and basically uh, they, they saw some pretty notable changes there. The cover grew back over the water, the water temperatures cooled, and that was much better for the fish. Uh, fish species and and so forth. And they also had a a real impact on bird populations because there are all kinds of uh, knock-on effects of predators taking down prey, buffalo, deer, elk, and so forth. And those carcasses provide all kinds of benefits to other species, bird species, vultures, uh, and so forth. And so they started seeing, you know, all kinds of things across the landscape are affected uh, by the return of predators. And I think that's pretty well accepted now in the science, but it's certainly not accepted in ranching communities. People are just not cognizant of how important predators are. And I think there's also been a real kind of willful refusal in a lot of these communities to see what a benefit is provided by tourism. You know, a lot of people want to see these animals. Wolves are incredibly attractive to tourism, bears. uh, You know, people are really curious about these things and really want to go to Yellowstone. And they've done studies that show that this has really provided you know, millions of dollars in additional tourism for people who want to go there and watch and take photos and so forth. But not everybody has been benefiting from this because I think people have just not opened themselves up to the idea that what we might lose in our ranching leases we might be able to make up for in other ways. The southwest United States has commanded a lot of attention since the mega drought arrived several years ago. Mm. And people are wondering if it will remain a viable human habitat going forward. I remember how shocking it was to learn that due to water overconsumption by urban populations, the Colorado River, the lifeblood of the Southwest, no longer reaches the ocean. As far as wolves are concerned, I'm holding my breath considering the severely damaged habitat and equally hostile humans, how does human activity have to change to have an ecological stability in the Southwest? It's really hard to look at the places where people have chosen to live here in communities like Phoenix, for example, and some uh, other cities in Texas and so forth. We've concentrated, you know, large populations in places where there just isn't any water. And so to deal with that, we've taken water from the Colorado and and we've basically kind of rerouted water to reach places where it's going to face heavy evaporation rates and so forth. And so 
it's hard to imagine that a city like Phoenix is going to be viable in 100 or 200 years. And I think probably that we're just going to see a big human migration from places in the Southwest if climate change plays out the way it's forecasted to. And we've already gotten some pretty severe tastes of that. California is is looking at some pretty severe, severe drought conditions that are going to probably change the way that people live there and do business there. There's nothing, I think, that rewilding can do about that, (laughs) unfortunately. I mean, I think that's just going to be a fact of climate and a fact of life. Um, But we can take all the opportunities that we have to try to, you know, encourage people to use less water, to use it more responsibly. I mean, here in Santa Fe, the water supply here has always been a little bit iffy, and people here consume much less water than they do in other communities. And that's going to have to happen in places like California. They're not going to be able to continue to have lawns and continue to use water wastefully. People's consumption patterns are going to have to change rapidly in response to the climate change that we're seeing. And we're also, you know, seeing scientists come forward and say things like, you know, because of the the kinds of fires that we're having in relationship to drought, Um, we're going to see really major changes in our biotic communities. You know, they're saying now that in the Southwest, uh, because of a lot of the extreme fire behavior that we've seen, very hot fires that burn the mountains and so forth, that we're probably not going to see forests grow back in some of these places. And that's going to change the ways in which people live here. It's bound to, and I think that we just are going to have to look at that really closely and start to adapt. On a um, brighter note, (laughs) can you tell us about the Washington Elwell River restoration, which has been the cause for much excitement in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, the Elwell dams are kind of an amazing story of, of how rapidly, and there are lots of examples of this, but the Elwell is, is really just kind of knocking people out because there were a couple of dams put up on the Elwha River decades ago, and they were not built to code. They were illegal when they were originally built. Um, they were kind of disastrous in, in every possible way, both to the you know Native Americans, 
and to the fishing community and uh, everybody hated these dams and everybody wanted them to come out. And it was a political feat of miraculous proportions that they were able to convince uh, all the powers that be to take these dams out if they were still trying to make this happen. It would never work in today's political climate, but fortunately this started happening a few decades ago that they started working on this, and so they have miraculously been able to to take these dams out. And the kinds of results that they're seeing are just fascinating. And it's happened so fast. That's what really blows me away is that with the removal of the dams, they've seen huge amounts of sediment come out, which was pretty scary because they were worried that this was going to possibly destroy fish populations before they could recover in in the river. But they're now seeing, even though they just removed the last of the upper dam, they're now seeing salmon above where that dam used to be. And they did not get there because they were put there. They got there on their own. So it's a really amazing phenomenon to see the salmon coming back, to see the sediment recreating beaches and shoring up areas along the the outer uh, shore that have really been eroded by, by years of, of sediment starvation uh, because of the dams. And so it's just, it's an amazing, amazing phenomenon. And, and to look at the pictures that are coming out of how that uh, whole system is restoring itself is, is truly um you know, gives you hope that we will be able to to accomplish some more uh, things like this. There are a lot more dams uh, in the Pacific Northwest that that need to come out uh, because they've either reached their lifespan and they're too expensive to to repair, uh, or and or because they're they're also really destructive to uh, salmon in these river systems. So. I really look forward to seeing what's going to happen with dam removal in the future. Are there any other um, examples like this river restoration project that we can look to and smile about? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are so many examples of things like what they're doing in Australia where people have been buying land or, you know, in Scotland, for example, there's this fellow who has has bought one of the big estates up in the highlands, uh, and he is hoping, I think, eventually to try and reintroduce wolves there, and it's probably going to be a while before they can win that political battle, but they've already started doing a lot of reforesting and trying to kind of restore the system by removing some of the non-native species. And and when you go and see these places, it's just, it is really heartening to see how quickly things can come back if we just get out of the way. (laughs) And it just can be really amazing because so much of Scotland is completely deforested and basically been grazed so that a lot of it looks either like a golf course or or like a tree farm because that's what they essentially were planting up there for many, many decades, these kind of terrible single species tree farms to use the wood. But when you go to these places where they've been trying to, to reforest the native plants, it's just like going into another kingdom or going back in time or something and being able to to glimpse how things were. And that's tremendously exciting. Well, the debate on native and invasive species definitely confuses me at times because I've heard debates on both sides and, you know, really good examples. One, you think, okay, well, having invasive species, they're wiping out biodiversity, they're not allowing what was once there to thrive. But then you look at these novel ecosystems in Australia, for instance, where it's this thriving invasive ecosystem that's allowing 
perhaps endangered species of birds or mammals to then survive in this novel invasive ecosystem. What have you seen in terms of that and, and what are your thoughts? It's always kind of a trade-off, and I think every single one of these examples, you have to look at what you stand to gain and what you stand to lose, <laughs> and they're very, very difficult calls to make sometimes about what to value and what may have to suffer as a result, and I'm not an expert on the whole invasive species thing, but I think we just have to look at what's the best case scenario that we can get from a particular place or a particular habitat. And clearly there may be some areas where you have to walk a fine line. I mean, there are some examples of things like in Costa Rica where the coffee, they've shown that coffee plantations do much better when they're planted in areas with high levels of biodiversity because uh, that tends to reduce the pest load mm. on the coffee plants. And so that's a really great example of some place where the greatest biodiversity has a real economic value. Then there are other places where, you know, people don't see that value. So it's always going to be a trade-off. Here in Santa Fe, for example, that we've really been struggling to restore the Santa Fe River, which most of the year is kind of just a dry ditch. And there are so many uh, invasive species growing along the river that, you know, it seems necessary to, to try and remove a bunch of trees that are just sucking up too much water when there is water in the system. But people don't like that. People are really resentful when you start cutting down trees because that's valuable shade here. And you can see it from both mm. both points of view. And you just have to try and get the best and fullest education, I think, about what the situation is before you start making decisions about it. And all these things enter into that decision. You know, is it an urban area? Is it a park? Is it a place that's used for agriculture? It's all a trade-off. Mm. I'd like to ask one final question of a more philosophical nature. Um, so rewilding transcends nations and cultures, and it seems like it's an extension of systems theory and the Gaia theory that identifies the earth as a living whole and all its species as sort of organs fulfilling ecological functions such as maintaining climate balance. This seems like a story people everywhere could potentially get behind, doesn't it? So would you say rewilding is helping to spread the story of interbeing? Well, well, I think you're you're well above my pay grade now. Because <laughs> 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 um, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, I think there are people who do really relate to talking about ecosystems on that level. I think that, that, that it's natural in, for, for people to try and look at, at uh, what is the earth in a narrative way and, and, the, and to see the earth as an organism, you know, to see it as a, where everything, you know, is connected and everything, um, you know, if we were able to restore enough of these processes, we would be restoring kind of the health of the planet in some meta way. And, you know, I can understand the appeal of that. I think to somebody like myself who is more grounded in the nitty gritty of the science, it can be harder to relate to. You know, I I think that the guy who invented the Gaia theory, was it James Lovelock? Yeah, James Lovelock. My, he's given some really fascinating interviews about this, which I really recommend to people. You can see a lot of interviews with him on the Guardian website where he talks about this and about the kind of damage that we've done in a systemic way and what the costs of that are going to be. 
And, you know, if it helps to, to think about the the planet in those kinds of terms, I have no problem with that. To me, the, the real fascination with and, and the hope for what we can do is grounded in a much more prosaic <laughs> kind of hands-on kind mm-hmm. of way. And so that's where I kind of focus my attention. But again, you know, to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, about these kind of sci-fi concepts, there, there's nothing more fascinating than trying to predict or forecast where we're going to end up. And I think it's important to try and do that as the background of of all these specific rewilding projects because you don't want to lose sight of what we're aiming for. Mm. And I think we do have to aim for something that is going to be planetary in scope because the planet will get along just fine without us. But if we want to have any kind of future that we want to live in, we're going to have to to try and imagine what that's going to be. Thank you so much, Caroline, for your words and your stories. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to hear that people are listening. <laughs> Drifting on the wind Through the mountains like a river Thank you for listening to Unlearn and Rewild, and many thanks to our producer, March Young. Our first musical interlude was a Kenyan girls' choir, headed by Salome Nolega, singing Mulima Hale. The didgeridoo track was called Bienengan, from a compilation of Aboriginal spiritual music called Didgeridoo Dreaming. And the flute music was a Taos Pueblo courting song from New Mexico, played by John Rainier Jr., and our theme song, Like a River, is by Kate Wolf. Drifting on the wind, through the mountains like a river.